As long back as I can remember, I've always been on a mission, and that mission is to discover and watch all the obscure horror films I can find. I wanted to be the Indiana Jones of horror movies and unearth films that no one really knew about. I wanted to introduce my weird friends to these so-called lost films. As a kid, I discovered movies like Don't Look Now and Eraserhead, and I thought, wow, no one in my friend group has ever heard of these movies, so I must have accomplished my goal. Ha! How naive I was. This was merely the beginning. With each movie I discovered, five more, even more obscure films took their place. From Books of Blood to Ghost Keeper to Next of Kin, to Ozone to Bloody Muscle Bodybuilders in Hell, my search could never be complete. I even started a YouTube channel to help aid me in this search. I have been digging down this rabbit hole for years, and each day I am shocked to find out about films that I've never even heard of. My search hasn't been completely in vain. Am I the only person in the entire world that's seen the horrible four at least half a dozen times and own the necrophiles on Blu-ray? Yeah, probably, but that's nothing compared to some people. Along the way, I have discovered the true Indiana Joneses of the horror world, and that is the boutique Blu-ray labels and the passionate people who work for them. Now, I've talked about different labels in the past, and most people are probably aware of the big ones like Screen Factory, Arrow Video, and the Criterion Collection. But boutique Blu-ray labels can feel like a giant rabbit hole themselves. New ones are popping up left and right, and with so many big-name movies being bought up by the big dogs, these smaller labels are forced to find the more obscure and forgotten horror films. One such label has really been kicking butt lately, and that's Terror Vision. Starting in 2014 by mostly finding and releasing obscure horror movie soundtracks, their movie releases as of late have been stellar. Brad Henderson, a former Vinegar Syndrome employee, has joined forces with Terror Vision, and the result has been spectacular. Using Brad Henderson's immense knowledge of the genre, as well as his connections, we've gotten some pretty remarkable releases because of it. From Holy Grail items like Linnea Quigley's Horror Workout, to the WNUF Halloween special, to the Japanese remake of Cube, to a 1981 Indonesian ripoff of Friday the 13th. And this seems like only the start. The sky's the limit for Terror Vision. With so many great releases, it's hard to choose which one to review. I currently own five of their titles, and I've already reviewed Video Violence, so for tonight, I'm gonna take a look at 2007's End of the Line. This is it. I haven't heard much about this one, but from what I did hear online, it's supposed to be kind of scary. Well, color me intrigued. Let's find out if End of the Line is worth your time. Welcome to the Hellbound Horror Show. I'm gonna be honest up front. I think End of the Line is totally worth checking out, and I don't wanna spoil this movie. I think it's best to go in mostly blind for this one. I did watch the trailer after viewing the film, and I think the trailer gives too much away. As I go over the plot, I'll roughly talk about the film in hopes not to spoil much. The film mostly revolves around Karen, who is a nurse at a hospital that specializes with patients with mental disorders. A lot of her patients have been complaining about the end of the world and how they are coming. One of Karen's former patients is released prematurely, and she ends up committing suicide by jumping into a speeding subway train. Karen is haunted by nightmares and visions, and when she goes home at night, she has to take the subway. While waiting for the train, a creepy man named Patrick confronts her, and he is bad news. A total creep. Luckily, another passerby named Mike defuses the situation and befriends Karen. Eventually, the train does come in the two part ways. While on the train, the lights flicker and the car stops. Karen begins to hear her dead patient's voice and creepy things begin to happen. Luckily, Mike comes to her rescue yet again. It is here where we meet the different people on the train. 
Now each person on this subway is in peril as a religious group fears the end of the world is drawing nigh. The religious extremists are here to save the souls of the sinners by stabbing them with a ceremonial dagger embedded in a cross. The people on the subway train have to find a way to the surface in order to get help. All phones, televisions, and radio signals are taken over by this religious group. How far-reaching is this religious sect? Is the apocalypse really upon us? And are the demons really coming to take over the world? There's more to it, but like I said, just wanted to keep it brief. Okay, it's funny, but when I first heard about End of the Line a few months ago, and found out that there were creatures in a subway at the end of the tracks, I put pieces together and thought this was somehow a Midnight Meat Train ripoff. I mean, End of the Line did beat it to release by a year, but Midnight Meat Train was based on a short story by Clive Barker, and it wasn't a secret that that film was being made. <laughs> I was so wrong. It's been years since I've seen Midnight Meat Train, a movie, might I add, I was super stoked for. I even have a poster of it right over here from when it was released, but I don't remember a lot of the themes. I don't remember a lot of the story elements, but from what I can remember, these two films are extremely different from one another. Instead of deriving from Barker's story, director, writer, and producer, Maurice Davaru took inspiration from real life. Religious extremism has been a thing that has negatively impacted many lives throughout history. Think of the Crusades and many different religious conquests. And the event that inspired Maurice the most was 9-11. They're not evil. They don't see themselves as evil. They don't see themselves as bad. They see themselves as doing the work of God. Um, and in, in my opinion, you know, the, the fellows who flew the planes into the, the World Trade Center were doing the work of God in their mind. And they weren't evil. And they're not evil. End of the Line is a bit different than most religious horror, as it's about how the idea of religion attacks people, rather than the religious forces like ghosts or demons attack humans. It falls in line closer to films like Rosemary's Baby, where there is more of a cult aspect to it all. This religious angle may do nothing for most people, but I enjoyed it, and personally for me, it worked. Another thing that has worked for me was the atmosphere and jump scares. In an interview, Maurice talks about how one of the jump scares has been given a lot of praise by fans, and some say that it even ranks with some of the best of all time. And it's really hard to argue with them. There was one jump scare that made me yelp out loud. Now, I've never really yelled during a horror movie before. It's not something that I typically do. I was taken off guard, and it was so well done. If you don't like jump scares though, don't worry. The film has a few, but it's not overly reliant on them. The gore is also noteworthy, being done by Adrian Marotte, who has gone on to have a heck of a career. Now, not all the gore is great, but there's a fantastic slit throat, great decapitation, and some other neat stuff found throughout. Normally, Adrian wouldn't work for such a cheap film. However, he was good friends with Maurice, so he decided to work for very little money, but ended up getting an associate producer role in the process. So, I enjoyed the film's concept, atmosphere, scares, and gore, but there's still some points that aren't great about this one. Some people claim that some plot elements seem intentionally mean-spirited. Even though it didn't bother me, some of the decisions seem to have angered some fans. Now, some of the color grading choices feel really mid-2000s horror, which sucks, but it didn't bother me too bad. A little annoying, but at least the colorless palette makes sense when you are underground. I wasn't a fan once the film became a group survival type of movie. At times, there were just too many characters which relieved all tension for me. In the beginning, when we are basically alone with just one character, I really felt uneasy. The tension was tangible. But as soon as we get into a large cast of oddballs, it became a bit more formulaic. Well, this person's gonna die first because of X, Y, and Z, but I don't have to worry about this person yet type of thing. Acting is also very hit or miss. These are all union actors, so that's impressive for a film that costs less than a quarter of a million, but performances are lacking in my opinion. I would say that all the acting is subpar, however, there is one performance that steals the show. Robin Wilcock, who plays Patrick, 
is on a different level. I was mesmerized by him and what he gave to that role. He's one of the biggest villains of the story. You hate him, but you can't take your eyes off of him. I was impressed by his performance. Will we witness the apocalypse or not? What do you think? Hmm? You know, everybody's been seeing the signs of God, except me. What is that supposed to mean? Am I not part of God's big picture? End of the Line is an amazing hidden gem. Can it go toe-to-toe -to -toe with masterpieces of that era, like The Descent? No, but my goodness, End of the Line is so much better than most of the crap that we got in the mid-2000s. So much was done with no money. Maurice Davarou did everything. He financed the film himself out of his own pocket. He directed it, edited it. He paid everyone. He made sure everything from craft services was set up to blocking shots. He even continued working when his father passed away mid-shoot. The cast and crew saw all the sacrifices he made, but he kept a happy face through it all. This was Maurice's fifth feature film, and even though End of the Line won awards and people generally liked it, it never led to anything. Maurice wanted to continue directing, but no one else gave him a chance. He wrote a few scripts after, and no one read them. So kids, sometimes it doesn't matter how kick-butt your films are, or how much work goes into them, or how original they are, sometimes things just won't work out for you. For every Sam Raimi story, there are hundreds, even thousands, of stories like Maurice's. It's not about how capable you are. Sometimes, it's just about luck. Just finished your screening. How do you feel? Uh, it went well, didn't it? I, you know, you never know. You're, you're hearing the screams, you're hearing the laughter, but you're still always wondering, did people like it? Did they, you know? It's, I think they did. I think they did. We'll see soon, I guess. Well, that's depressing. I can't recommend End of the Line enough. It's not a masterpiece, but it does a fantastic job with the limited resources it has. And if you want to watch it, you need the Terror Vision release. It's the American Blu-ray debut of this movie, and there are so many special features. Let's be honest, the movies never look better. You better pick up your copy now because you never know when the end of the line is coming. If you don't trust me and you want another opinion on End of the Line, well, you're in luck! My good friend Steve from Retro Analog Entertainment just released his review of End of the Line today! So check out his channel and see if his opinion differs from my own. He runs a wonderful horror channel filled with plenty of reviews, so check him out and tell him I sent you. And that's all I have for tonight, so thank you so much for watching and stay spooky everyone. Thank you so much for watching until the end of the video, I greatly appreciate it. Please consider supporting the channel by subscribing or by buying me a coffee in the description below. What's your favorite Canadian horror film? I'd love to know in the comments down below. Thanks, bye.